First up, a wonderful talk from uh, someone that's been here for a long time and been part of the DevOps community for really since the beginning. Uh, I give you John Willis. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, it's great to be back. Hey, um, all right. There we go. Good. Uh, for those of you who are offended by this hat, you will understand that I got to see Mickey Mantle when I was a little kid. So that's my excuse. All right. I want to talk about a book that really, it, turned, it started out as an idea that turned into um, a conversation that then turned into a paper that then accidentally turned into a book. And now it's sort of like a bestseller on um, some of the categories. There's a lot of categories though, yeah. So you, you gotta be careful with the categories. Um, anyway, that's the, oh no, oh, there we go. Um, I'll give you just a second if you want to just you know, take a picture of this. Go. I always like to have the slides when I'm presenting. You know, um, sometimes that's, I, I, you know, I, I'm gonna give you my theory here real quick. I think the slow scale is the fast one. So it's kind of like an Iceland Greenland thing, right? So, um, so I went with slow. We'll see if I was right. Don't all switch over to slow right now. Um, okay, this is not working as designed. Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay, this is me real quick. I'm not gonna spend too much time. I actually have done like, um, uh, when you get over 10, which sounds sort of arrogant, but like I forget how many number of books I've written and I forget how many startups I've done. Um, but I've done somewhere north of 10 and somewhere north of 10 books. Um, probably the most notable though is I wrote the DevOps handbook with Jez Humble, uh, Patrick DeBar, Gene Kim. And then uh, me and Gene did a really cool project uh, it was audio only. And then really the genesis of this presentation sort of starts the stake of the ground with that green book there where we created a reference architecture as a group project, which then turned into book. As a side note, if you've ever heard of Dr. Deming or you want to learn about Dr. Deming, I've been down this vicious cycle on him for 10 years. I'm literally in a week from now, that's going to be an orderable book. You can order that book. I, my, like, like I am obsessed with this guy. Um, he was an industrial engineer that, um, anyway, I, but that, I'm really happy that book is now real after 10 years. So uh, that's what a pandemic does for you, right? So um, I work for a bunch of companies today. I work for a company called Costly. We do have a booth out there, but this is not a vendor pitch. That's really the only time I'm going to talk about Costly. Um, and I've done just a whole, I was, in fact, I gave the first chef presentation here at Scale. Like I, my heart is this place. I mean, the first, anybody from Chef who gave a presentation on Chef. It was me here at scale. Um, and I do play guitar, not really well, but it is, I think I have to be closer to this maybe. Uh, so this is the book. Um, I did happen to pick it when it was number one. It's not number one anymore, but um, it's out there. Um, and here's the thing, it, it isn't about investments. It's, we'll, we'll get into it a little deeper, but it's about a bank that gets an audit and has to go through this sort of core chronic conflict of crisis of like, why did this happen? And, and it, there's a line in it later, I'll just steal it for now. It, there's a, a line where the advisor-like person says, your DevOps failed you, because they didn't include security. They were literally showing up, fictional story, they were showing up at all these conferences, and um, you know, and the, um, you know, and like they thought they were doing great, and then all of a sudden they get from the OCC um, a nasty letter. And so the, I do want to give attribution, Tobo Powell was the first fellow at Capital One, it was him and I who basically started having these conversations back in 2017 about like, could we do as an industry better at internal audit? Um, you know, reduce the toil, um, increase the efficacy. Um, turned into that green book I'll talk about. John Rezatowski is now at um, um, Dexcon, but he was at PNC Bank and he implemented it. So we wrote this reference architecture. Next two years, he implemented it. And then when we came back to basically vertical version two, which turned into the book. It was really a lot of their story, but, but uh, Jason Cox from Disney and those other people as well. So, uh, um. And so I wanted to start with this. I was sort of playing around with this and I put it on LinkedIn to see if anybody said this would be terribly wrong. I think it's okay. Um, so here's like, I, I, like, see if you relate to this, right? So um, basically, let me put my glasses on. Um, Basically, so this conversation starts out on Monday, Sue the auditor, internal auditor says, I'd like to have some um, evidence of something that, of a change that I saw on March 1st, blah, 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 in, in the check marks log. Um, I don't really know what the check marks log is, but please give me um, something from it. And then Bob, the sysadmin says, uh, let me get back to you, Sue. And then Bob pings uh, Bill, 
and says, Bill, can you find the checkmark log for this? Bill comes back to Bob and says, Bob, you know Tom wrote all that automation, and he didn't document it. Now he's not here anymore. And by the way, I'm working on the customer first go to cloud project. So what do you want me to do? And, uh, and meanwhile, um, you know, Sue is like, hey there, you know, it's already Tuesday. And uh, Bill, any luck to Bob, right? And then uh, again, Bill's like, dude, like, you know, do you want me to stop the cloud first, customer first, customer care? Or do you want me to work, go find this? And then so Bob just says the classic Bob answer is, damn those orders. Just do what you can do. So Wednesday's Taco Tuesday. Wednesday is Taco Tuesday. So this company is in big trouble, right? Um, and so uh, and then on, on Thursday, Bob, I found it. Here's the link. Oh, great. Sue, sorry it took so long. Here's the link. Thanks, Bob. And then Sue, like, Bob, looks like I don't have access to that directory. Bob, it's like, come on. This is not something that's happening in your companies. Um, let me get back to you. Okay, now I got to find the person who gave me access. I do all that, and then, um, but the problem is they missed the cab meeting, right? So now what's going to go on is I got to wait basically another week. But you know what? Bob, told, Bob calls uh, Bill and says, you know what? Use Firecall. Just go ahead and <laughs> give her access. Like, I don't want to spend another week on this. So sure enough, we get to Friday. Everything's great. Sue, you have access. Monday, Sue pings Bob again and says, actually, you know what? I need the Nexus log. And it starts all over again. Because, so what, what this problem is, is like anybody been in the subway system in Tokyo, right? It's like, there's two problems with it. One, one is it is incredibly complex. I've been all around the world, right? I, I think they win the sort of war, the award for complexity. And if you don't speak the language, it's compounded by that complexity. And the reason I give you that slide is because, and I like the Sonatop folks, so this isn't a dig on them, but this is one of their prescribed reference architectures for DevSecOps. And so imagine the Bob, Bill, Sue scenario of, okay, I don't even know where the last change was, right? And then let me go find that change, and then, oh, by the way, I, just because you put it in service now, doesn't mean I really trust what you're saying. I need to see the evidence, and the evidence is somewhere down in there. And by the way, it may have been rotated, and the logs are gone, by the way, something that happened at SolarWinds. They don't really know how long it took. They don't really know how the breach of when they really got in there, okay? Um, the, I mean, so the, I mean like, if somebody might get an error, remove a directory, Rewrite the automation. Like, like, this is the real stuff that happens in large enterprises, in case you didn't know. So the, 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 I told you earlier that we sort of started with a green book, but it really started back in 2015. Gene Kim, who wrote the Phoenix Project, invites about 30 or 40 of us up to Portland. We try to get, you know, like, Barclays Bank, um, the DOD, um, just incredible people, and we work on these projects, and we produce these, these guides, and they've been going on for um, 10 years now. In fact, I just came from there yesterday, so we got a whole, a whole new batch. And, uh, and it's, it's an IT revolution, they're all creative commons. I mean, it's just, and it's not just security, it's across the board. It's how people have been solving DevOps problems in our industry at the highest level. Um, and uh, so, in, back in 2015, we worked on this, like, you know, DevOps and Audit, an unlikely candidate. Basically, it was how to do separation of duties with DevOps. Um, Dear Auditor, I'll talk a little more about that. It was a tongue-in-cheek apology letter to the auditors. You know, hey, you know, like, we're sorry we forgot about you. You know, the DevOps people, right? Like, um, and, um, but then it talks about like, what, what we're going to do as the DevOps people to, to sort of really make this better. And then, like I said, in 2019, we wrote this reference architecture. And, th and the key to reference architecture was we had two goals. One was to increase the efficacy of audit and reduce the toil. We had some sub-goals like turning subjective evidence into objective evidence, but I'll talk more about that, right? And then we went back to do a version two and we realized that was the most boring book that ever existed in the history of all books, the green book. And we decided that, you know what, we're gonna go take a page out of Gene Kim's book, book which is write it in a novel format. So we wrote a novella, uh, Gene Kim's uh, publishing organization came to us at the end of two months and says, we want to see this as a book. 
I grabbed the team. So by the way, don't write a book with nine authors unless it's an accidental book that becomes a book. Um, so, but, uh, but it actually worked out pretty well because there was a lot of uh, sort of, you know, like the people on the book, you know, like Helen Beals worked with Lloyds of London, uh, Jason Cox at Disney, Michael Topo Pal, I told you about. So it's incredible uh, around of knowledge. So the Dear Auditor letter was interesting. It was an apology letter, but, and there was some, some things we said, we're gonna bring you along. We're basically telling the internal auditors that like this DevOps things we forgot. We forgot, you know, this DevSecOps was like our apology, right? Of like, um, you know, and, uh, and, and what was interesting about it, it, it really created, um, I think like 56 um, risk controls in this publication. So this is, it's a tar file, it's a, it's a p paper. You can download it, Creative Commons. But the one that sort of like stuck in Topo and I's, you know, when we were thinking about this, and all these things are relevant today, right? Um, PAM, SBOM, of course, um, GDPR, um, you know, red teaming. Uh, but the number eight was the divergence of audit evidence from developer evidence, right? That was the thing that we just saw that was a big problem here, you know, right? Um, and so it was the, what, what we tried to attack in the green paper. And so the, the thing that you see is, or what I see is, you know, that, that subway map problem or the, or the SONA type um, reference architecture, right? Like, th there, there's another thing too, right? And I took these slides out because I don't want to run out of time, but, you know, there, and this is going to sound simple, but there is a DevOps heuristic. It's the last change, right? Like if you read the SRE book, it will tell you that. If you read Gene Kim's Visible Ops, it will tell you that. Um, you know, it, it, it's in basically all, if you know John Ospar and his master's thesis of he, what he did is track incidents at Etsy. It's an incredible paper. He, did, he got his master's on this. Um, it, it, the first heuristic was it's the last change. So that's for incident we know that. And for change, for audit, what did they do? They randomly select the change. So it is change. So how do we get from a developer to the change? How do we get from operations to the last change or the chain of, ch chain of changes? And how does risk and IT audit? In other words, they have to deal with that subway map. And so this idea that came up, what we've been talking about is this idea of an evidence fault. Could you be one click away from the last change or the, sometimes the last change might just be a config file change, so it might be the change before that, which is actually, you know, the, the binary that got changed. Um, and, and, and the config file could cause a massive problem too, but uh, the, um, and so the, you know, this sort of uh, wheel of compliance where, what if you could just, you know, get people to one click to the last change? And anybody in that list, right? Security too, right? SRE, platform engineering. Like something, an incident, or I'm trying to audit and here's the goal too, right? I don't want to, the, another sort of sub goal of that first green paper was, could we turn 30 day audits into zero day audits? Right, could you just hit enter at any given time? Or you, could you say, like this is truth. So I say, think blockchain, don't use blockchain. Fortunately, there's this really cool thing called Merkle trees, which basically answers that question for me. But like something that's immutable, digitally signed immutable evidence they can't be, ta it's tamper evident, basically, and humans don't create the attestation. And now, can we get that and then be one click away from that, from all those three, the auditors, the, um, the operations, DevOps, platform engineering. And so, like I said earlier, was the goal was to shorten audit time, increase audit efficacy, uh, reduce cab activity. Like, like, how do we reduce cab activity? We, we have to earn trust. And what's the greatest form of trust? It's immutable, digitally signed data, right? It's like we, like we trust that with our banks except Silicon Valley Bank, but um, everywhere else, like we accept that like we store all our money in a system of record that is basically based on a crypto trust. Um, you know, so the, um, so the idea is, is, let me look at my time here. Um, yeah, we're doing good. So, so I, we started playing around really early about what are some sort of traditional compliance and then continuous compliance and so, you think about process conformance, it was checklist, right? Like at what's in the service now? Because I mean, honestly, I travel to lots of banks and a bank seems to be the sort of where the money is. But, but I, you know, I talk to healthcare and, and, and they, it, it seems everywhere I go, this is the thing is people basically stop audit at service now. I did blah, I did blah, I did blah, I did blah, I did blah. If you want to know anything else, go call Bob to get Bill, right? Um, but how about, what if we could put another form of an artifact, which is 
I can't risk this code because policy as code is very overloaded right now. Because I think, like, and, and you know, like the discussion on policy code has gone to like admin controller, or OPA, and that's fine. But like, I'm talking about something completely different. I'm talking about a, a DSL abstraction that basically say from basically commit, but even pre an ideation, but like that's another discussion, from commit all the way to production, everything that happened and I got a digitally signed attestation chain that tells me these things happened as opposed to those things being described in a um, service now record. And that being one click away, and then we'll see in a minute, one click away from the actual evidence. So, um, so the second, um, is um, you know change management right like self-documenting change the way we get the way we get removal from having to go to cab is we are self-documenting and like I said earlier it is based on trust and then this idea that we can get to um, to sort of uh, compliance monitor like continuous like we trust you know one of the things I've been thinking about is can we take back audit in a corporation. We, we don't, like, all of what we do in IT, you know, there's this notion of first line, second line, third line, right? And we basically don't own the audit of our own stuff. We are just um, actors in their play. Get me this log. Why is this log? How come the Sonotype log, how come the Nexus log doesn't match the uh, Sonicube log? Well, they're not the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, but, no but, right? Like, can we take it back where we basically say, this is immutable evidence of what we do. If you don't believe it, if you don't think this works, then you really should be worrying about like the system record banking data because we're using the same technology. And so, yeah, anyway, I, like, you know, these are some of the things that I, you know, I, I spend a lot more time in other presentations that you can follow up on, but like thinking about um, a security scanning as an attestation. Did it happen? Did it pass fail? Where is the scan artifact data? Uh, risk control, uh, um, unit tests, right? There's a lot of things that happen that may or may not be a PSI DSS. They may be borderline, like test coverage. I have a lot of clients that are sophisticated that will say that for this application, it's got to be 80% 80, 80 coverage or it can never be decreased. Or cyclonic complexity, which is something, you know, SonicCube gives you. Every vendor that literally puts a check and a gate on cyclonic complexity. No, there's, I don't think there's any sort of compliance guideline that says, in fact, I'm sure there isn't, but why not? The behavior of how we do things, we're sort of creating behavior changes with this as well, right? And then, um, you know, information leakage, secrets, like that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so this idea that we could create then a dashboard that could be one click away from the last change Right, so now we have this risk is code that is an abstraction layer of all the things we really want to know about, not just the things that will stop us from getting into Kubernetes, which are part of the things we want to know about, but everything else. Was there a, par was a, was there a review on the pull request? That is a PSI, that's a NIST. Like, like where does that show up in your attestation? I tell you, most people I meet, it, it's a description in the ServiceNow record. What if that could be a fingerprint um, so, so imagine that you could, anybody from, and I'll show you some examples, but for any service on the last change, they could see all the things that were defined in the risk profile. And, and, and again, the trust is like, this is digitally signed. I mean, it happens to be in a Merkle tree in some examples. Um, um, so remember I talked about sort of developers, operations, and risk? So what if you could provide those same sort of badges, if you will, like where all the things that red, yellow, green of all the risks that were defined, and not just the things we think about to get into the admin controller, but like a pairing on a pull request, a, um, a test coverage, cyclomatic play. I mean, you name it. it. Your application has to have three squirrels in a wheel. Like, and I, I, I have to see that. I don't care. It's just a webhook, basically. But, so, but the developers, you know, I think right now, like I'm, I'm banking that um, Backstage is probably the place they're gonna wanna come from. So, uh, you know, so we've been doing some, uh, it's, it's sort of an industry, we're working on Investments Unlimited 2 book. I don't know if it's gonna be a book, it's definitely gonna be a paper. Like we did a prototype of um, a Backstage implementation, a Backstage um, plugin that you could show the badges so you could see there's literally um, a, a, a compliance service uh, and you can imagine, um, like, one of the things I'm trying to get um, 
the team on the IUI two, Investors Unlimited 2 is to, could we put the same interface and service down? So that's where the auditors go, or some service management tool. You know, and, and then sort of operations, um, maybe a very operation-focused interface. Now, here's the thing, too. This is the thing. Uh, so Bill Bensing, who works with me, we worked at Red Hat together, and we really tried to drive this as, a, as an opportunity. We learned a lot. But the, um, one of the things he did for the Department of Defense, so the Department of Defense had this uh, DevSecOps reference architecture, and um, they call it Dead Sword. And um, Bill had built Red Sword, which was Red Hat's implementation of Dead Sword, right? Um, and one of the things that was a requirement was, and, and I love this, because this wasn't a, something that we thought about in the original Green Book, which was um, they wanted, as part of the Dead Sword architecture, to not just have the subway map of go find where the, whatever the you know, check marks or any sort of nexus log is. They wanted an architectural structure so that that got archived and put in a directory, so that was sort of an artifact. So we didn't have to worry about did the directory change, did it get rotated, did the, the you know, did like after, it, it rotated after six months or a year, right? Um, and by the way, in large banks, I see this all the time. These, these logs get rotated every six months, these logs, and then, anyway, I, I go on forever. Um, the tier, you have like customer facing tier zero apps that have dependencies on like tier three, and because those are the, the, the CICD. Well, those things are evidence. So you think tier three, we can rotate logs every year, right? Like this is the thinking that goes on in our, for like large banks, right? All right, so the point is, what if you could take the data from, you know, in this case, it was a prototype with um, open SCAP, you know, STIG basically, and, uh, and then show that we've archived it. And so when you get that one click to the change, the next click is that file. And here's the really cool thing. There's this thing called SIGSTOR. And we can sign the fingerprint to the artifact. So not only can we ensure you that you always have that copy when you need to audit or whatever you need to find out from, from an incident or audit investigation, but that it is now, we don't have to worry about what directory it's in, did, did it rotate, did whatever. It'll actually come up and say the chain is broken between the fingerprint and the actual archive data. And we use SIGSTAR for that. If you check in the SIGSTAR, it's pretty awesome. Um, it was a joint venture between Red Hat and, um, and Google, originally for certificate transparency. But it has this great way to do sort of attestation evidence data as well. So, so um, yeah, so like here is a, a, a sample o open SCAP evaluation report we ran. So imagine you get the change, you're in backstage, you're a developer. I mean, maybe developers don't care about open SCAP. They should, <laughs> but, but you know, maybe the auditor does, right? And so they're in service now, they hit the click on the, uh, the, the what I would call it is a badge, which is the thing that, out of all the things in the risk as code said you should, should do. And they can go with two hops to this and know, by the way, you know, one of the things we're playing around with, and in all transparency, like I'm not trying to act like that, I'm not a vendor and I, we're trying to do this as a vendor, but I'm really trying to stay away from being a vendor pitch. But I'm working in, I'm working in open groups to solve this so that any vendor can do this with us. So let me just be clear. So if you go to our booth and say, yeah, that's sneaky, was literally, you know, because you will see some of this stuff at our booth. But the point is, if anybody knows me, I focus on industry improvement. That's what I do. So I'm 63 years old. I've been doing it for an awful long time. Um, but the point is that, um, the, you know, the, the, like the auditor, it will come up and say, by the way, there's a mismatch in the hash here. That would be immediate evidence that something's been tampered with. Um, you know, I, 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 I think when I said uh, a certain vendor before, I watched somebody's face go white, so I won't say the vendor name anymore. Um, the, the, there was, um, there was a um, um, MITRE attack framework analysis from CrowdStrike on this vendor's big breach. And one of the things that happened from the, from the CrowdStrike MITRE attack uh, framework description, the logs were tampered with. That's how devious the act of the, these actors are. They, like, if you follow some of the things that happen when the, and the, the internal cleverness of these adversaries, I mean, don't think that they're not gonna tamper your logs. They will. And if they could get into your, uh, like, oh, well, they'll never get to our logs. Well, then how the hell did they get to the Java service that runs customer, you know, withdrawals? 
Um, so, all right, so back to the story. Um, there is this book. Like I said, we did the green book, and we said, okay, let's do a version two. And we started going through it, and I started, you know, like, when we wrote the green book, which was the uh, 2019 Dev, DevOps, um, you know, the DevOps automated governance reference architecture, we were like, oh, man, everybody's going to download this. This is going to be amazing. Every vendor on the planet is going to go ahead and build this, right? And then, like, three or four years later, like, it, it was one of the least downloaded books. I'm like, all right, people really don't care about security, <laughs> you know, in the DevOps community. Like, um, and so we started writing a version two, and I'm like, you know what? I don't want another boring book. And we decided to create it as originally a novella as part of this research project, right? Let's make a story. Anybody read the, the Phoenix Project? Yeah, so like it has a narrative. It's, I, I call it the gold ratian um, trope, if you will. But it's, uh, it's based on an original story by a guy named Elliot Gorak called The Goal. Gene wanted to write a modern version of it. it all, all these books have this mentor-mentee relationship where the, uh, the mentor doesn't ever give you the answer. You know, have you all met those kind of people, right? They make you figure out, which is good, but like it's frustrating. So we have that, and then so we, picked, we decided to create a company that was investments only, uh, like 1,000 employees, 20 billion market. I mean, that's really small in the financials. In fact, a lot of the big people at the forum were like, Man, that's a, that's a really stupid story, but like, I'm sorry. Like, we wanted to make it like small enough so that we could have the taste of what you have to go through with banking compliance, but not big enough to write like a 400 page novel, right? Um, so uh, they had a mature DevOps practice, right? They literally would show up. We were sort of taking people from the group, you know, um, like so like one of the characters who speaks at DevOps Enterprise Summit, like, it's the most fantastic, works from an entertainment company, sort of like the, uh, the um, yeah, ah, it's, it's, it's um, he's sort of like one of the authors of the book, right? Uh, you can figure it out. I mean, he gets up in these stage and it's just, I mean, lights are flashing and he talks about how they do DevOps to do that, right? And uh, so we were sort of like using like that, that character is like, man, when I sit in the audience and I see such and such speak, they must be way ahead of us. And so, by the way, the CEO thought they were way ahead of everybody. Right? So, they, so yeah. But here's the thing, right? Um, they had a mature DevOps practice. But there's this thing called in uh, the OCC, the, um, basically the compliance organization that determines whether you're a bank or not. Like, they will take away your bank license. And unlike, like, you can have a, you know, uh, like, I say this carefully, but you can have a fatal airplane crash. And chances are that airline is not going out of business. You could have a baby die in a hospital or, or, or somebody die in a hospital, and chances are that hospital is going to shut down. There are scenarios in financial where you, get, you, you lose your banking license and you are no longer a bank. Right? So, um, so these things called matters requiring attention. So the OCC will send you these, like, we didn't like that one. And some banks get so overloaded that they get a lot. So ours, our fictional version were 15 open in one year. And then what happens is the CEO gets a call from a friendly at the OCC and says, you're about to get what's called a matter requiring immediate attention. And that's the, for a CEO, that's the stare of death, right? Um, that, that is like, if we don't do something right now. So she grabs everybody, puts them in a the room, and like, I thought we were doing DevOps. Oh, yeah. We forgot to tell you about the security side, right? Uh, and, that, you know, and then we, we, we took the apology letter of the original thing and we sort of built that into it. Like, um, and this is my like, favorite line in the book, right? It wasn't my line. Uh, Bill actually, Bill Benson's the guy who came up with like, So Jason, this mentor guy, gets over in the room and he's usually dressed like me. He looks like a bum, you know. He's, in every sort of book that you'll see, they have this like character that's like brilliant, but you would never tell by seeing them walking in the hallway. Um, and um, that's my life, right? Um, and he says, he says, everybody, your DevOps has failed you. Like, just so, like, oh, my goodness, that is so, like, awesome, right? Like, because that's, you know, like, we think, like, a lot of times in our industry, we thought, oh, okay, God, this is great. We're doing this. I saw that person speak. I'm going to try to implement that. I come back next year. I hear this. And we're doing a great job. I mean, if you're in this room, chances are you're doing a great job, right? Because you're in this room. Not because you're listening to me, but because you're spending the time to learn from people all day long today, and the vendors that are solving incredibly hard problems. 
But sometimes we get these blind spots, and that was one. You know, there's the... Um, I spent way too much time do, doing the Equifax breach, right? Like, in a, I definitely get huck. It's like the Deming thing. I didn't go that far. I, I, I probably should write a book about the Equifax breach, but I thought about writing a musical. Wouldn't that be awesome? Equifax to breach the musical. They're like, yeah, come on, man. That's got to go to Broadway. You know, so, but, uh, but anyway, the, there's some really good stuff in the, um, the House Represent Committee did um, analysis of it, and they actually did a really good job. They, um, and there was some really cool stuff in there. One of the things, uh, there was a whole bunch of really, like if you like sort of understanding and dissecting complex problems, you know, like I spent a lot of time on the Air France 447, you know, uh, was going, like the, the, some of these aviation, like very much, and if you want to hear more about that, like go read Sidney Decker or, or John Osbar. Uh, but, um, but the thing is, is the, the one of the ones I loved in this, which was the, um, when the, the they, when the, Congress had asked the CISO, why didn't you, no, asked, yes, yeah, so the CISO, why didn't you notify the CIO of the breach? So the CISO had found out about the breach before the CIO. And the answer was, I really didn't think of it. Right, I, like it wasn't top of mind. And, and, and like you probably have heard um, the Conway law, Conway's law, like I think there's a rule that if you're giving a DevOps presentation, you must mention Conway's law. So, um, but it's a pure Conway's law. Right, because this, we, you know, like this is funny because in our book, we created a Conway's Law-like structure. We, we had a, a, CR, a CRCO, Chief uh, Risk and Compliance Officer, and we had a CIO, which basically reported up to the CEO. Well, that's why the CISO at Equifax, the CISO it was worse at Equifax, the CISO at Equifax reported to the Chief Legal Officer. So the answer to the question was, in that case, all of the concern was from a legal and financial perspective. It wasn't like the, the, they had set up a, a structure, an organization that literally told them this is the way you needed to think. You know, and so we purposely did this in our story to say, you know, that, and this Jason Colbert is the sort of the mentor thing and that literally skips through and starts having a conversation with Bill Lucas. And if you've read the Phoenix Project, it's basically the Bill Eric relationship. It's a Jonah Alex if you actually read the goal, right? Um, what, this is the most fantastic part of the book. Um, where am I at? I'm oh, good. The, um, so we're about halfway through the book. And by the way, like one of the things we don't have in study exercise, we literally in the middle of writing the book. So we finished the, the paper and they said, hey, what if we gave you another eight months to turn this in the book? I'm like, yeah, it'd be great. So halfway through that second part, this thing called log for j hit. And so literally, I lost all my authors for quite a long time. Because <laughs> they were all running infrastructure at Disney, at, at PNC Bank, at like, you know. And so, but that's a side story. At some point, somebody knew, um, somebody who was on the CISO team at, um, at the, uh, this, um, basically, it was called, um, it was basically the Japanese Mitsubishi UFK. It was Mitsubishi's North American Bank. And um, so we started, like, hearing some stories, and all this is public. But they had um, 15 MRAs, just like Investments Unlimited, open for over a year. They got an MRIA, Matter of Retiring Immediate Attention. They ignored it. Susan Jones from, from the Investments Unlimited didn't ignore it, and that's where the story diverges, and they got a cease and desist from the OCC. They literally went out of business in North America. And so I was like, oh my God, we had wrote a, wrote a fictional story that we made up from thin air, and here's a financial solution that actually had the exact same story. Um, I know you're not getting excited as I am about this, but this is really cool stuff. <laughs> Don't let me tell you how I do searches on severe, and fast, uh, severe um, enforcement actions from the FDIC, right? Like, I'm, I'm in this, like, crazy world right now, sorry. Um, you know, so anyway, the team basically goes ahead and, I mean, it, it's a really a story of, like, DevOps, DevSecOps, how you work with internal and, you know, like, like it, 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 I think what happened there is not everybody on the book was a security expert. But what we were able to then do is tell a narrative of how reasonably mature DevOps practices would go about solving this Susan Jones, like, hey, like, I don't want to get put out of business. 
figure out what this MRIA is telling us, and let's do something. And the ultimate goal was really to sort of write that the, 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 there was a lot of sort of um, culture and social things in the book, but ultimately it was to build that sort of badges system to be able to show that we've taken back audit. We're not proxying it to somebody else, right? And so anyway, there's a lot of this sort of, you start with a Google Doc and we say, what are the first things? And, and uh, so, um, and here's another thing that sort of comes along in, in, in my sort of travels is this notion of the three lines of defense by the uh, IIA, basically internal, uh, the Institute of Internal Auditors, right? Which is basically the guidelines of how most organizations do internal audits. They sort of set the standard. Um, Gene's been writing about this for years. Um, and the way this sort of works is sort of interesting. So Andrew Clay Schaefer, a dear friend of mine, um, cohort, was, you know, we, me, Andrew, and Damon Edwards ran the first DevOps day in the U.S. I was the only American at the first DevOps day in Ghent. Um, so Andrew, I go back a long way for, with Andrew. In fact, just as a side note, since I got a little extra time, I've been losing a lot of weight. And, uh, and that's great, thank you. And Andrew, 10 years ago, told me, because 10 years ago I said, I'm going to lose weight, and it took me 10 years to lose the weight. But, but the, uh, he said, if I, I said, if I can lose this much weight, I'm going to jump out of an airplane. And Andrew said he'd jump with me. And I think this summer we're going to be able to do it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but anyway, um, Andrew had created this really cool thing years ago um, at one of the O'Reilly conferences, and he called it the wall of confusion. And it was really the caricature of DevOps. It was the dev, this wall, and ops, right? And like before the sort of the sort of the, the strong DevOps conversations, right? It was you know developers throwing their stuff over the wall, ops trying to catch and say, I don't think it works right. Ah, you just don't understand it, right? And and it was a beautiful caricature. And then as I started learning more about the three lines of defense, they're actually a two-wall system. By definition, they really don't want the third line talking to the first line. And I guess in some universe, that's a really cool and smart thing. <laughs> but when you, you know, and there's a lot of things I realize when I talk to some type banks and, and they're in sort of just getting out of waterfall and they're going to do their first sort of one deploy a month. Right? And I'm not making fun of them. It's just where they are. Like, they don't think any of this is a problem. But when you're doing 1,000 deploys a day, or in some cases, 1,000 deploys an hour, this, become, this doesn't work anymore. Now, I'm saying get rid of the three lines of defense. Not, like, I'm not that naive. But this idea that third line should never talk to first line, second line needs to be the translator and the owner. I have these incredible conversations with second line people about how broken the system they live under it is. And like, naive me, why can't we send all three lines to design and requirement meetings? <laughs> like, seems like that would be a really cool thing. Could we create, uh, you know, a risk is code structure so instead of arguing all the way down on the right side why you didn't hit this compliance or this risk control, could we have an upfront conversation about what this stanza in a YAML file actually means? Now, you may not get it right, but you'll get much closer in a conversation at an audit time. I mean, is this making sense to anybody? Okay, a couple of thumbs up. I got one thumbs up, so. Hey. The good news is only about 10 minutes left, so. Um, I've got to literally point at that thing to happen. So hey, this is like this, sort of, there's a couple more things, and I, I think I'm going to give back some time to the sponsors and all that. But, uh, um, so they, they, they built a demo. And they build this, they, they literally build what we described in the, uh, the original 2019 book. They build a demo, and this is like demo 101. Like, again, for all these people that we've been doing demos our life. So they do the demo, and they got everybody in the room, and it's like, wait do you see, we've got Susan, come on, sit up front, we're going to, Susan's the CEO, right? And everybody's like waiting for this demo, and it runs, and, and the whole thing passes. No fail. People are like, yeah, okay. No, I gotta go to, I'm going skiing this weekend, right? And, and like somebody's like, you know, I know what we did wrong. Anybody know what they did wrong? Yeah, thank you. That's why he's getting a, a book earlier than everybody else. <laughs> and we'd already talked about that, right? Uh, I'm doing this book signing at around noonish, Or come by the booth to get one and I'll sign them at noon. So I got a slide for that. 
So yeah, so they put the, uh, the fail in. And everybody's like, oh, now I get what it is. It, I just love that. Again, that wasn't my idea. It was somebody else on the team. So, um. And so this idea that, um, you know, we, we're trying to say that there's maybe this thing called modern governance. You know, because if you say automated governance, I mean, the old school people say, isn't that Archer? I don't think it's Archer, but like, no, <laughs> it's not Archer, right? Um, the, um, you know, so this idea of modern governance of like something that could separate, I, uh, Shannon Leeds, who's been an incredible mentor to me, she's one of the most brilliant security people that I've ever met. Google her, read everything she's ever written, watch everything she's ever posted. If you didn't get the name right, track me down, I'll give it to you. I, I love Shannon Leeds. I said, how about cloud native GRC? And if she could have reached her fist in through the Zoom session and punched me in the face, she would have done it. All right. <laughs> okay, Shannon, I get it. <laughs> so she helped me sort of come up with this, like, how do I create a word that the old school security people, she lives in both worlds, will say, oh, I need to figure out what that is. Because automated government sounds like something they've been doing forever. You know, I think there's a notion to, like, the idea of this model, it's not, I mean, we focus on so, uh, software supply chain, security, because right, that's you know where the money is, right? But but the um, but it, it's really any workflow. We've got API development. I did a presentation called the uh, the hidden links recently, where like the whole API development flow, not documenting all the decisions you make in the API development flow, the things that you're using, the tools, right? Um, and um, and SRE, like this is like the Dora data. Now I have a presentation about Dora and how we need to be better about that. But that's uh, you know. But the point is, there's like all this stuff could become evidence that we can use for incident resolution, remember the heuristic, or audit, or even just general improvement. Um, you know, and then, and like, there's a, my good friend Jay Bloom talks about adaptive squ skills liquidity, right? So just Google that, and he's got some good stuff written about that, right? So all this, like, ties in. Can we be smarter? You know, one of the things I love is when I've implemented this at a few places, um, Good. The, we've interviewed this at a few places. The, um, the, one of the things you see is an increase of developers creating self-identified risk. Now think about that. That means we've crossed over from we don't tell auditors things they don't already know, or those auditors are a pain in the butt, always bugging me and stealing 30 or 40 days a year of my time, to like, hey, auditor, I think this thing that we're doing and it causes latency might be a risk that we should basically get um, scaled out to everybody else in the organization. Like when you see that, beyond the auditors, beyond the sort of incident management, you know that you've shifted to a very healthy domain. And so I am obsessed with Dr. Deming, which means I'm obsessed with something called statistical cross control, which basically means I am obsessed with analytical statistics. Um, I didn't think I have enough time to go into this, but once I have the data, whether it's risk, because remember, all those attestations are forms of data. Anything I can, and like, like if it's two squirrels in a wheel, so the thing about analytical statistics, this is what's called a control chart. Anybody familiar with control charts? Oh yeah, a couple, right? So, you know, I got nothing against ML, apps, but I mean, like, great, God bless you. But this is tool, that's been used for 100 years from toasters to airplanes to, in, uh, to um, nuclear power plants. And one of the things they do, and like ML and all that, like they're using statistical algorithms under the covers. This just uses basic statistical, I mean, it's, it is very complex, but algorithms to take your data, take the human out of the decision of the data, and tell you what your, it, have the data tell you what you need to know. And, you know, the short, short, short version of this is there's a six sigma, that's, that's six standard deviations, three above, three below. And you just throw the data at it. Instead of me thinking, like, what does 50 mean? Should it be 51 or should it be 49? <laughs> there's a powerful statistic, analytical statistics tools will take that data and tell you what 50 means. It'll tell you whether it's three sigma above or three sigma below. They call it a special cause. Or... If you're in, it, within a Six Sigma and it's sort of straight lining up, 
something's about to go really bad. I don't know what it is, but we'll go find out. Or if it's going above the line, below the line, above the line, below the line, it's something called thrashing or tampering. Somebody's like moving it to the left a little bit. Eh, that's not, the CEO is like, I think we ought to like move it to the left four feet on Tuesday. You know what? I was wrong. Move it to the right eight feet. Like there's a funnel game by Deming. It's like brilliant, right? Like it is literally a game of dropping a marble where it uses four rules of tampering. Anyway, this is incredible. And one of the things I, I was at the, um, I spoke to the Dora group, the Google Dora group um, yesterday morning and I spoke, I gave a presentation on this kind of concept to uh, Gene's crowd. And I, I just want data. I, like if you've got Dora data or you've got some data, um, you know, I want to prove in our industry that what they do in the airline industry, thank you, and, uh, you know, sort of nuclear power plants, that we could use the same tools they do to be way more intelligent. I said this yesterday in front of all the leaders in Jeans Pack. I said, in our industry, sorry folks, um, if the airplane industry built planes the way we deliver software, I would not fly on a plane. Um, so that was one of your slides. Uh, me and Bill have been working. I've been following Salsa. If you haven't seen Salsa, it's really awesome stuff. Um, the only thing uh, like we've done is we think there's a lot more that needs to be discussed. So what we did is we sort of tried to explain Salsa. To, you know, Bill is like a guru on it. I've been following it since day one. Um, what we did is um, we tried to explain it between the two of us. So if you haven't heard about why you should know about it. But then we also wanted to add in that there's a lot more to think about, things like psychometric complexity, test-driven coverage, and so like, could we expand that conversation? So uh, we, we have a, like, here's the thing, if all my career I've never had a good graphics department, go to work for a Norwegian company and you get incredible graphics. Although they'll make weird pictures of you though. Um, and my wife likes it, I hate the, their picture they created for me. These are, these are my two founders, by the way. And I'm like, my wife's like, I like that. I'm like, okay, all right. As long as my wife likes it. So that's me. Um, <laughs> um, so the costly booth. Um, if you're interested in my Deming stuff, please come by and talk to me. I'm like obsessed. My book's coming out. I'm like, I mean, I'm going to create um, a handbook. That's my next project based on the book that I wrote. Um, my LinkedIn, I'm Botch Gloop, John Willis, Costly .com, And I think that's, that's the picture, right? I don't know. Hands up. Who thinks it's a good picture? Good. You're an honest group. Thank you very much, everybody.